to. Bill Greider, I want to ask you what role economic globalization played in all of this. Um, right now, over at the World Economic Forum, uh, Wen Jiaobao, the Chinese premier, uh, said Beijing w blames the United States for the economic breakdown, saying inappropriate macroeconomic policies, an unsustainable model of development characterized by prolonged low savings and high consumption, the blind pursuit of profit, and the failure of financial wow. supervision all contributed. Wow, that's strong. That's very... I mean, and China is the largest holder of uh, U.S. government he, debt. China is our banker. I mean, that literally. China, uh, has having, having accumulated huge trade surpluses and, and capital, has been the lender. It's not the only one. There, there are others. But it's the lead lender that has kept Americans going in the illusion that you could year after year borrow and spend more than you produced. Economics doesn't allow that, not forever. For a while maybe, but not forever. And so uh, we're in a position now where China, we have to get a bailout from China and Japan, the Arab the oil states and some others to keep us going as we work through this um, huge global recession. And I think the deal that's possible is that the U.S. can say to those creditors, okay, give us the loans. We, we'll go a bit deeper in the hole of debt, but we, w because we're such a good consumers, we will be the lead engine that pulls the world out of this recession. In exchange, we are telling you now that the trade system, the global trading system, must be reformed and balanced. We can't go on like this. Ultimately, you can't go on like this. And by and that, I mean bringing down the trade deficits, which have rung up more than five billion do, trillion dollars in debt over the last 15 years, imposing some rules on U.S. multinationals so that they can't just roam the world as free riders, moving jobs and production wherever they choose without regard to the home country. I mean, there's a long list of reforms, which I've written about and I write about in this new book. My point is, this is a moment. If, if the Obama administration is, 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 has the nerve to go for a global compact that doesn't just help a recovery, but actually rearranges the world in fundamental terms. I don't know if they're big enough to do that. And those terms are? Well, you'd start with balanced trade, not perfectly, but and you'd start with a new in global institution for finance that is represents both not just the advanced countries with with uh, with strong economies, but the developing countries and balances their interests through currency exchange and other. It would, it, would, uh, it would begin to build a structure of global rights for workers and communities, which is, of course, absent utterly now. And by that, I mean a way to mediate between the high-wage workers in countries like ours in Europe, Japan, and those folks at the bottom who are in the sweatshops. I mean, the reality of our time, not so well understood, is that it's very much like the English Industrial Revolution. The workers are exploited on both ends. If you think of the, you know, uh, William Blake, the poet, wrote about the dark satanic mills of, uh, in England in 1800. The skilled craft workers were thrown out of their jobs and they were replaced with children. And the children, of course, were completely defenseless and exploited. But so were those other workers who had been cut out of the prosperity that their country was achieving. That's a small picture of what is happening globally now. And I'm among those who have been railing at this for 20 years, actually, uh, without much effect. But now we're in a crisis that maybe will awaken the governing elites to the, to the, to the reality that they have to confront this. And, and, uh, and build labor rights and other protections into the system, or we'll go right back into that hole.
It's interesting you talk about building labor rights because last fall it was reported Bank of America received something like what it was a $25 billion uh, from the government. Three days later, according to the Huffington Post, Bank of America's top executives were busy. Uh, were they trying to right the sinking ship? No. They were coordinating a conference call to organize opposition to the Employee Free Choice Act, uh, the top legislative priority of, of organized yes. labor unions. I was at a forum last night in New York City and uh, and talks and uh, a woman and her husband came up afterwards who were employees of IBM and they were saying you know IBM is at the White House meeting with the president and doing good talk about the economy and all that and meanwhile it's shutting down jobs and moving them to Asia so what's the nature of this game are we are we are we trying now to revive the American economy for everybody or are we simply uh, facilitating the process that's already underway, which is that, that, is that um, U.S. multinationals for the last 25 years have systematically gutted high-value-added uh, high jobs, the ones with the good wages, when they could, when they needed to, and, uh, and gone to cheap labor elsewhere. And, do you, and do you it, see... It, it, sorry. Do you see the system... Right now, the world... Uh, economic forum is going on at Davos, the World Social yeah. Forum is going on in Brazil. Uh, do you see going back to 1999 when you had those thousands of people in the streets of Seattle with uh, Bill Clinton coming in in a plane in the middle of the night in the tear gas uh, who had pushed so hard for so-called free trade, um, yeah. really twisted the arms of Congress members when NAFTA was clearly going down to force it all to happen? We're not there yet. I, I, I think more likely, to be blunt, is that uh, Seattle will look like uh, an organized and, uh, and civil appeal of, of popular distress compared to what I think we're going to see. And, I, and by that I mean uh, you can't do this to people year after year. That is, upturn their lives, take away what they thought they had earned, and so forth and so on without provoking um, rather intense political reactions. We're just, just beginning to see a few bubbles like that around this country. They're rioting in Eastern Europe um, and, some other, and, and some places in Asia. Um, I don't say we're going to have riots, I, but I think people will, uh, and I hope for this, people out of their own distress and anger will organize their own politics and they will make themselves seen and heard around this country. And we've seen some sit-down strike in Chicago, which actually succeeded in getting the workers their, their rights. Uh, we're seeing the beginnings of, uh, of a foreclosure, anti-stop the foreclosure movement. Uh, the, the nation has a terrific piece this week uh, by Ben Ehrenreich describing that. Um, that's what happened in the 30s, of course. That, 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 the people did not finally wait for Washington to do the right thing and solve the problem. They recognized that that wasn't in the cards, and they would take their action as they could on the ground, in the workplace, elsewhere, politics. Um, this, is, this gets messy really fast, and some of it gets ugly. But, but if people understand their own power as citizens and act on it, take some courage, um, that will be the core of, of this politics we are in. Bill Greider, I want to thank you for being with us. He is National Affairs Correspondent for The Nation magazine, forthcoming book, Come Home, America, The Rise and...